tonight our lesson will be from 2 Peter. We're going to take the thought from verse 11, but we want to read the verses that head to that first. So we're going to read 2 Peter 3. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 15, though the lesson will be from the question, a rhetorical question that Peter asked in verse 11. So 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come in their mocking following their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the hand of, or excuse me, by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and all its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. So the question was in verse 11, since the world is going to be destroyed like this, what sort of people ought you to be. The question that Peter asked, what sort of persons ought you to be, is in light of the fact that we are in a passing world. We're in a passing away world. And we're told here three different times in no uncertain terms in this text that this is a temporary, this is a transitory world. This is a world reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. So one of the things that this world is, it is a, a thing kept for judgment, a thing kept so that those who need punishing in the mind and will of God will receive that punishment. So the world will go in fire, and the souls of those men will go into destruction. Then he says, after having said verse 7, it's by fire, in verse 10 he elaborates a bit and says it will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and all its works be burned up. Uh, So today we have people who are worried about some of the works of men uh, being destroyed. Uh, We have uh, people who are tearing apart uh, some things of of, uh, past culture they don't like, and they're tearing it down, and the people who want those things to stay up say, oh, you can't mess with history, you can't mess with these things that have been here for so long, Uh, they should be counted as sacred, and uh, the other folks are like, nope, this has got to come down. And uh, back in the 60s, uh, when the rioters were going loose, uh, and they would set fire to things, one of the things that they would chant as they watched the things that they set on fire burn as they would chant, burn, baby, burn. And the people who owned those properties or uh, people who uh, 
you know, felt some loyalty to the institutions uh, which uh, they were setting ablaze, uh, they were aghast at that. How could you, how could you uh, feel that way? Well, it's all one day going to burn. There's no monument going to make it. There's no building going to survive. There's no cultural relics going to survive. One day, this entire world, by the word of God, will go. And it says here a couple of things about that. It will go with a great roar and an intense heat. Even the elements will be destroyed. Now, I don't know how people understood this before, uh, you know, the time of nuclear explosions and nuclear energy. Uh, but now we've seen what happens when we set element against another and we start breaking the elements apart. Uh, we get the most amazing explosions and we get the most amazing noise. So, uh, we get destruction of, at the elemental level and just destroying a little bit, a few elements. Just destroying a few elements in the nuclear explosion sets off light, heat, uh, uh, destruction like you can't believe. This noise, this roar, this heat. And so, you know, now uh, that we know that, uh, I, that's kind of how I picture uh, the world going away when all the elements turn on each other. Not just a few that have been, you know, uh, primed and set into uh, uh, the nuclear uh, reaction, but just imagine if all the elements at, at once go after each other. Well, there would be a great noise, although I don't think we'd hear it, and there would be a great heat. I don't think we would feel it because we would go very quickly. And then it's explained again in verse 12 that we are to look for, forward to this day uh, by our faithfulness, we are to hasten it. Uh, we are to hasten the coming day of the Lord, on account of which it says the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements with intense heat. And so even the heavens will be destroyed by burning. And I just can't imagine, as we look above, uh, either the uh, you know sort of the mid heavens, uh, the atmosphere or if we look at uh, heavens in the sense of space, but all of it, all of it's going to go, all of that will burn. And so what Peter said there in verse 11 was that this really for us should very much be priority setting, that this should set for us uh, things that uh, are counted as important, that things, uh, of what things that are counted as absolutely needed and necessary, uh, what things are actually of eternal value, knowing that anything that's tangible, anything made up of the elements, anything uh, that is of this world, it won't last. And so it should really be for us a priority-setting uh, realization. So he asked, what sort of people then, what sort of people ought you to be? Well, for one thing, he said, he said that we should be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And so since it's going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Well, first off, people with holy conduct and godliness. It turns out that because this world is temporary and there is an eternal part uh, of us and an eternal reward that's coming, then we should be expecting that. And we should be looking for, verse 12, and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And so looking forward to, so uh, we don't tremble in fear that such things are this way. We look forward uh, to these days. And so we live and look in hope because it says in verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so hope is one of our great key words of the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 13, now abide what? Faith, hope, and love. And if we go to looking for verses about hope, we end up with 120 or more uh, to choose from. We might just take these three from Titus. In hope of eternal life with God who cannot lie, promised long ago, we live and conduct ourselves. Or Titus 2, looking forward to the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or Titus 3, having been justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of 
eternal life. Maybe some passages from Hebrews. Uh, This hope we have is an anchor for the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. Or Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So the first thing, and it comes to what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? An expected people, an expectant people, a people looking for the things that God has promised, looking for the reward that he has promised to those who love his appearing, looking for the forgiveness and reconciliation that we have in Christ, looking for those things to be uh, and go to a new level, to reach a new uh, layer for us of reality, uh, a new sense of coming to us. And so uh, we should, as Christians, be a hopeful and expectant people. Maybe not always hopeful about this world. You know, there's certainly a lot of things in this world uh, that don't look uh, uh, you know, very encouraging. But there is another world beyond this one, and there is the place we have set our hope. So what kind of people ought we to be? Well, in holy conduct and godliness, looking forward to the and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And so we're going to be an expectant people. Also, knowing that there is a reward with the Lord uh, when he comes, we'll also understand the need to be a diligent people. It says there in verse uh, 14, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, this coming of the new heavens and new earth, the one beyond this one, the one in which righteousness dwell, beloved, he says, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So a, be a diligent people, be diligent to be found in peace and blamelessness. Peter begins and ends this second letter with the encouragement to uh, diligence. Back in chapter 1 and verse 5, he said we were to apply all diligence to our faith adding moral excellence and knowledge and the other uh, Christian qualities of which we studied uh, some last night on our Wednesday night study, and we'll study some more in the future lesson. But we are to diligently add to our faith. And so uh, we start and end Second Peter with instructions to diligence. And in Romans uh, chapter 12, uh, let those who lead do it with diligence and not lag in diligence. And in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, so show diligence so that we can uh, realize the full assurance of hope. And to the Ephesians, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And in Hebrews 4.11, be diligent to enter that rest. One more in first, in, here again in Second Peter. 2 Peter 1.10, be all the more diligent, he says, to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Or the old King James, make your calling and election sure. And so, diligent people. So we're an expectant people, and we're diligent people. Diligent in peace, diligent in uh, adding virtues, diligent in hope, diligent in the things of the gospel, diligent in our life in Christ. With that, thinking about another world, not this one, as we expect this other world to come, and we surely do expect it and live in hope for it. So in this world, we're peaceful because this world is not the thing we're terribly concerned about, uh, this world and getting ahead in it, this world and uh, making sure that we uh, possess enough of it. Uh, this world, and making sure that we get our reward and we get our security and we get our comfort and we get our enjoyment and we get all the other things which people think will satisfy but do not, and they seek them all in this world, but instead, notice what it says, be diligent to be found in him in peace. Do this in peace. Now, we think about the relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ. It is a way of peace. It is a way of reconciliation. It is a way of uh, where he has uh, smoothed over the things that are difficult uh, in, in our souls, and he has settled our souls 
and he has given us a peaceful rest with him. As the Proverbs say, Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. There's, there's a, a peacefulness that we are to have uh, that comes from God and that radiates through us and, and out of us where the Lord is protecting us, giving us peace, protection on every side. And in this one it says, again, Proverbs, making even his enemies be at peace with him. Now, that's a general rule. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there are some who will not be such uh, peaceable people. Uh, that they, they live in direct rebellion uh, to God. So we have this admonition, Romans 12 and 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And we think about in the last uh, uh, couple of months, uh, we think about the, uh, the, the turmoil that has uh, rocked our society as people have taken different positions uh, about uh, how to approach the, the virus and precautions related to it as people have taken different positions on uh, uh, the civil unrest uh, uh, that has gone uh, with uh, after the death of uh, Mr. Floyd, uh, those who uh, back the protesters, those who back the police. Uh, one thing we don't have is we don't have a lot of peace. And, and people have just, in, in all sorts of petty ways, uh, turned on each other. And if you, uh, if you find out a fella supports the other side on any of these things that are of conflict today, it just seems like the gloves are off. And uh, almost nothing you can say about them in some circles. Uh, it's nothing's beyond the pale. There's there's no limit. There's no uh, there's no uh, uh, conciliation. Uh, there's no soft answer that turns away wrath, but only the harsh words that stir up strife. And we have people who show uh, today in the world no evidence at all of the peace of Christ ruling their hearts. And then you hear some Christians talk about the things that are going on, and they don't sound any different than the people who have no peace. They don't sound any different. They don't act any different. They don't post on social media any different uh, than those uh, who don't know peace at all. And you wonder, well, why, why don't you show some of the nature of the conciliation, uh, the kindness, the gentleness, uh, the forbearance of Christ in these things? Well, it's because those people are wrong. Okay, so they are, uh, or maybe they're not. But uh, I just think about all the people that Christ dealt with that were wrong, and uh, so few times when there was uh, any kind of, of uh, vitriol, or there was any kind of anything that anybody would would say, well, he just kind of lost his temper there, didn't he? No, he did not. And so uh, we are to be people of peace. We are to be diligent to be found by him in peace. So not just at peace with God, but at peace and in peace with one another. Be diligent to be found in peace. So when he comes, what will he find? Jesus asked, uh, you know, when he came, would he find peace on the earth? Would he find faith on the earth? Peter asked, make sure that you're one he's going to find in peace. Be a peaceable person, as the uh, Beatitudes say, Matthew 5 and 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so pursue peace. That's what the Hebrew writer said. Pursue peace. Peter said, be diligent to be found in peace. Make sure when he comes, and like so many of the uh, parables of Jesus, uh, did the servants know when the master was going to return? No. But what they need to do? Uh, be doing the right thing and be peaceful in this, in this regard so they might be found in the right way. And so don't come up short of the grace of God. That passage continues. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Do not come up short of God's grace. And let there be no root of bitterness springing up, which has defiled many. No root of bitterness. Today we might uh, less poetically, but more directly say, don't be resentful. How much resentment do we see? 
how much of dissatisfaction. And people are, are aggrieved that other people have certain things, that, that things in life are the way they are, that certain people have different positions and places, and there is bitterness and resentment, not just a root of it, but the full-grown tree. Well, that works contrary to peace, and you'll never have peace if you're rooted in bitterness. So what sort of people ought you to be? Expectant, knowing the Lord's going to come and set it all right. Diligent, and the first thing of diligence is to be found in peace. And then spotless and blameless. Spotless and blameless. Uh, Peter uses the same uh, turn of phrase as the Apostle Paul did when uh, Paul talked about what uh, Christ did for the church, that uh, he redeemed her, that he uh, gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory with no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but she should be holy and blameless. So no spot, no wrinkle, holy and blameless is the church as Christ intends and the church that Christ redeemed. And here Peter says, be that church. Be that, be that bride of Christ. Be at peace and spotless and blameless. And so here's our duty to maintain this. Here is our duty uh, to uh, stay spotless and blameless. You think about the bride, uh, she's going to be in when, you know, she's dressed in her wedding dress. Uh, how much effort has gone to keep that dress clean? You know, a lot of times it's carried to the venue, packed in a special box. And then so many times as soon as it's done, back in the box it goes. I know that there's some folks today that have some silly traditions for pictures called trashing the dress and things like that, but that's that's not the attitude of, of folks of any generation before this one, and people would be aghast that the, they would do things uh, like that. Uh, or think about the, the, you know, when we took our little kids to church, uh, what do we tell them about playing after church? We would always tell them, don't play, don't have any fun because we're at church. No, we told them, don't mess up your church clothes. Have fun, but have fun appropriate to the clothing you're in. Well, here we are as Christians. There are things that we can do in our our life and our conduct, and there are participations that we can have in this world, but they have to be suitable to the spotless and, and blameless character that we're to maintain. It has to be suitable to those, uh, you know, the clothing uh, by which we're clothed in Christ. And so uh, the book of Revelation, the, the fine linen given the church is the righteous deeds done by the saints. Well, do those righteous deeds. Uh, uh, be building that kind of, of, uh, of clean clothes washed in the blood of the Lamb, uh, made of fine linen as uh, you live the life that Christ has directed so that you may maintain this spotlessness and blamelessness. And again, that's with diligence just as the peace was, not by accident that any maintains this, only by uh, the diligence uh, that they're committed to in Christ. And then we see verse 15. And the last thing it says, it says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, so there's that expectancy again. Beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent, he says, to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, which we read, and, here's our last one, and, regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. Regard his patience to be salvation. And so you think about the, the time of God and how patient at times he can be. First uh, Peter 3, the patience of God when he was waiting in the days of Noah. Waited for Noah to build that boat, and it took a while. His patience in dealing with Israel. His patience in their uh, many generations of unfaithfulness and their continual idolatries and their continual straying. But he said to them in their covenant right at the beginning, and he proved it over many centuries to come. Exodus 34, 6. Then the Lord passed in front of him, and he proclaimed, Jehovah, 
the Lord God, compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And so he is slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, which is a word in the New Testament we often associate uh, with mercy. And so slow to anger and full of mercy. But God's patience is purposeful. God's patience is to help us. God's patience is for our uh, repentance. God's patience is for our salvation. God's patience is for us to enjoy more of him before he ends this world. And so we need to not do what the uh, Jews of New Testament time did, which was Romans 2. He says in Romans 2, as, as they lived uh, a sinful life, thinking everybody else was wrong but them. Romans 2, 3. And do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things, all of those terrible sins of Romans 1, which we have no trouble passing judgment on people for doing because they're all wrong, that do you not know when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you'll escape? the judgment of God. And then he goes on to point out the things that they did which were the same or equivalent to the sins of the Gentiles. And he asked them rhetorically, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And so they thought because God hadn't punished them that uh, they were right and they were in good stead. But the patience of God was for their repentance. Well, they, they used the patience of God to just further think of their self-righteousness. Well, we must be doing something right. He had not got us yet. Oh, but if you keep like that, he's going to. Yes, he is. And so uh, let his patience have its purpose in us, that it may be salvation, that it may be repentance, uh, that it, it, the time he gives us helps us to reach with diligence, these obligations that he has given us, that we might come to know him, to love him, to be saved by him, to understand that this is a passing away world, but we, we believe in and serve and will be rewarded by an eternal God.